Anyway, so Sean and I are splitting this, but we're just going to focus on a few policy issues, but talking at a very broad level. So we're not really going into the detail, because I think, as you said, it's, um, there's just so much over five days. And to actually go down, drill down to the sort of minutiae. So, what we're hoping is we'll give you a bit of a taste of some things, and then we'll give you some direction if you want to find out more about particular issues. Just first, I'd like to say how much Melbourne embraced the conference. I mean, you couldn't, you know, if you if landed from Mars, you would have known there was a conference on. Mm -hmm. And and the people of Melbourne are very friendly anyway, but they really did embrace the delegates, and there were signs of the conference everywhere. It was just wonderful. It was a colourful, wonderful experience. And Sean will have us some other photos later. So the theme of the conference was stepping up the pace. Um, the, there were a number of major policy documents that were sort of released around the time of the conference. Um, one was the Melbourne Declaration, um, the AIDS 2014 Melbourne Declaration, which um, I've actually given you a copy of. I'll say a little bit more about that in a later slide. There was some discussion around proposed UN AIDS targets, as a lot of you will know, we're at the moment, Australia is a signatory to the 2011 UN Political Declaration on HIV, but the UNAID, uh, UNAIDS has proposed some significant treatment targets, which I will also just briefly mention. There was an AIDS 2014 legacy statement, which um, I understand Andrew Barry won't actually be coming today, so um, I thought he was actually going to discuss that, but I have again given you a copy of that. Um, it's a document that all the ministers of health in Australia have signed to, which basically says they're supporting our push towards um, you know, the, meeting the UN targets by 2020. And then the, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade also came out with strategic priorities for Australia. Again, I've given you a copy. So I'm not going to go into these documents in great deal, but you've got copies for your own information. <coughs> Some of the hot topics that we'll just briefly touch on today, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis and treatment as prevention, which I'll discuss. And then Sean will look more at the HIV testing, HIV cure and, and vaccine. So the, the Melbourne Declaration, and uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm a bit of a, um, I like my notes, it's like my security blanket, but that's just the way I <laughs> do seminars. Um, so these are some of the, the main points from the Declaration, but um, this was actually launched in May 2014 prior to the conference. And really, if it's to summarise it, it states that non-discrimination is fundamental to an evidence-based response to HIV and, a public, and effective public health programmes. And it calls for immediate and unified opposition to these discriminatory and stigmatising practices. So the slide has included um, um, some summary of the declaration, but also at the bottom is a link to the declaration. And if you go onto that, you'll find out more. But also, if you want to sign that, you're very welcome. Um, and a number of very eminent people from the conference have already signed the declaration. So please um, have a look at that. Um, this is a little bit about the proposed UN AIDS targets. So as I mentioned before, currently Australia is a signatory to the 2011 political declaration, but the UN AIDS has proposed new treatment targets for 2020. And they're saying um, by 2020 that 90% of all people living with HIV will know what their HIV status is. Of those 90%, a further 90% of those of all people diagnosed with HIV will receive sustained antiretroviral therapy. And then of all the people who are receiving antiretroviral therapy, they will have a durable suppre viral suppression. So that is the aim. And as a result of that, if that is successful, by 2020, 73% of all people living with HIV globally will be virally suppressed. Now that seems like a very ambitious goal, but the UNAIDS feels it is ambitious, but it is achievable. Um, I'll probably, again, talk about some of the things that will impact on that um, as they go through. Okay. Some of these slides have been adapted from some of the slides presented at the conference. So this just gives you a summary of the range of HIV prevention strategies which are currently available. Some not necessarily available at the moment in Australia, but around the world. And obviously, um, you know, many of you will be using these in, in your work practices. Um, so what, as I say, I'm going to focus on today is um, antiretrovirals for PrEP uh, and also treatment as prevention. But it's, it's, it is um, important to be aware that there is such a range of things and, and not all these strategies will be relevant in, in different settings. So we sort of really have to look at the, the armoury of what we have and work out what is appropriate with particular groups. 
This is a slide that was used a number of times at the conference, and it's um, summarizing the clinical trial evidence around different strategies to prevent HIV transmission. The one that you're probably most um, aware of and have heard of is the, the HP, uh, HPTN052 trial, which was the one um, that has led to treatment as prevention. So that trial, um, which was um, work done by um, Cohen et al. in 2011, um, it found that antiretroviral uh, therapy prevents HIV, um, sexual transmission of HIV from an infected partner to a, a non-infected partner in a serodiscordant couple. And further to that trial, um, ART was um, approved for HIV prevention. And as I say, it's now known as treatment as prevention, or TASP. But as you see, at the moment, um, that is uh, regarded to be 96% effective. Um, that is, again, in trial situations, and so the question is, in real-life situations, would it be nearly as effective? But um, other trials are looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis, male circumcision, um, microbicides. At the moment, they're not indicating such effectiveness. Again, there was a lot of talk. Um, there are a lot of presentations at the conference from the Global Fund for AIDS, hepatitis, um, sorry, <laughs> AIDS, um, TB, and malaria. Um, and one of the keynote speakers was Mark Dybell, who's the executive um, secretary, the director of the Global Fund, which is based in Geneva. But this slide actually shows um, globally in 2019 how much money was spent on prevention, research, and development. Um, as you can see the uh, sort of orangey, sandy coloured bar, um, that relates to prevention, preventative vaccine, and the blue one is microbicide. So a lot of money is obviously being put into those, um, followed by um, treatment as prevention, less so for the other preventions. But you can see a lot of money, significant amount of money over the years has been um, put into research and development. <coughs> So I think one of the things that the Global Fund um, is recognising and, and everyone at the conference recognised that if we want to meet the 1990-90 targets by 2020, significant amount of money will need to be poured into, into HIV research and prevention. There was a call at the conference that um, uh, countries of, um, with populations affected by HIV need to actually um, uh, give more of a domestic contribution to the Global Fund as well. The Global Fund is um, like a bank. So they don't actually run <coughs> programs. They basically get the money and they work out where it's best used around the world. Just briefly, I'm going to talk about, um, talk about two slides now, one on pre-exposure prophylaxis and then one on treatment as prevention. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is, is an emerging biomedical intervention for high-risk populations. So basically, it's giving antiretroviral drugs, I'm sorry, I'm probably speaking totally converted, but it's giving antiretroviral drugs to people who are not infected with HIV but are at high risk of infection to prevent them becoming infected. Um, and this was discussed at so many sessions at the conference. Um, there's uh, so much controversy around it because um, you know, a lot of groups think, well, this is available, why shouldn't I be getting it? Um, there are, and the WHO has actually strongly made a strong recommendation about its use in um, high-risk NSM in conjunction with condom use. Um, there have been, the FDA has also got some guidelines and um, although it has been mentioned in the recent um, HIV uh, strategy, which was released recently, um, Truvada is currently not approved for pre-exposure prophylaxis in Australia. So currently it is only being used in trials in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. Um, there were a number of presentations on um, new means of provision of PrEP. But at the, so at the moment, it's a, a daily pill. Um, there is some discussion about whether it could be done inter intermittently, and there's a trial looking at giving people two tablets prior to having sex, and then they have one tablet after 24 hours, and then a subsequent tablet 48 hours later, so that's another trial. But there are other trials looking at whether it should be done by injection or whether it could be implant, um, questions about how long people should be on it, questions about who should be the priority groups, and then questions around risk compensation, which is if people are on a PrEP, will they maybe uh, let go of the other prevention strategies they may have been using, such as condom use? And it was also mentioned around injecting drug um, users. I think there was one paper about people not actually using methadone because they were... Um, so there's a lot of discussion around PrEP, but very controversial. WA has actually now decided we need to do, come up with some position for ourselves and um, they've actually uh, developed a small discussion paper and there have been initial discussions with some key stakeholders about what we should do. 
Um, there was a call for national guidelines on, on this, so we'll keep you posted out what's happening. And then my final slide is on treatment as prevention. <coughs> so as I showed earlier, there was a, um, the, the work done by Cohen in 2011, which showed that the, at the clinical trial level, um, that treatment was 96% um, effective. But the question is, is it effective in the real world? Um, TASP is primarily um, used for preventing morbidity and mortality and is a byproduct of virtually no additional investment. Um, it's used for preventing HIV transmission. So in theory, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic treatment. And if it could be work, used in an ideal situation, it would be wonderful. Um, Mark Dybal from the Global Fund indicated that it shouldn't be regarded as a silver bullet, um, that we should maintain all other prevention strategies. And I think, as I said earlier, looking, you, you know, you have to look at the population you're working with and work out what's the best um, strategy for them or a combination. And then um, uh, Professor Abdul Karim from South Africa um, gave a plenary where she indicated she felt there were some major obstacles to um, task implementation. Obviously, she's, she's talking from like more of a third world um, situation, but I think a lot of these things are, are relevant for all populations. Many people don't know their HIV status, um, so they wouldn't know to get onto treatment you know, early. Um, it's difficult, to, they're difficult to reach groups. Um, clinical infrastructure to link them into care is sometimes lacking. It's difficult to maintain people once they're in care. Um, with adherence, there's a risk, um, if we don't adhere, there's a risk of resistance. And then is there a leakage in what we call, they called the cascade that people have tested and then they may be lost when they're being linked into care and then further will be lost with regard to adherence. So I, I think treatment as prevention is an issue that we should all be aware of, but it's not the, the be all and end all to HIV prevention. Sean, it's over to you. Thanks, Eve. <coughs> Are we on time? Do I need to um, step up the pace? Or? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. So, I don't need to step up the pace <laughs> in my presentation. Um, thanks, Sue. So I'm going to talk a little bit about testing, and, um, and it, obviously it's linked to um, HIV cure. So uh, there was a lot of talk at the conference about reducing the time between infection and diagnosis. I think we all know this. This is pretty obvious. Um, you know, there, there, there are two big advantages. One is decreasing onward transmission when we do that successfully. And the other, maybe the most important one, is improving the health of people living with HIV. Um, and similarly, there was a lot of talk about improved um, testing technologies. Um, in WA, we now have the ongoing trial of point of care testing at the M Clinic, and a similar trial starting um, at Royal Perth Hospital. So rapid testing has come to WA um, in a limited form, but we know that the technology is always improving. We're expecting that down the track, um, the point of care testing technologies will be increasingly accurate and the window period will shrink um, and the test will be better at, at, at sort of finding uh, primary infection. Um, also, we know that there's the oral swab technology which has been around for a few years um, and there are some advantages and disadvantages. It is used for uh, self-testing in, in the United States. It's approved for that use um, and can be purchased at the chemist. Um, but a really interesting alternative that was presented on at the conference is home-based testing via blood, blood spot. So, you know, the advantage um, here is that a person can still test themselves in the privacy of their own home, um, and yet they can sort of post in this blood, blood spot um, and know that a reputable laboratory is getting the result um, and sort of can feel confident in maybe a slightly higher accuracy in, in the result. And I want to apologize to Sue. I don't have any, side, any kind of inside knowledge as to the Scottish independence vote. That slide has an error. That should not be in UK and Scotland. Um, but there was a presentation by, I think, Public Health England and by an organization in Scotland. So that's, that's what I'm referring to. And both of these presentations showed that, um, showed that, um, that uh, there's definitely, there was definitely a market for this kind of testing. There were, there were people who were interested in this. Didn't mind too much that it would take a few weeks to get their results, um, as long as they had that privacy. Others, of course, want the rapidity of the, of the rapid test. Okay, I'm gonna talk a bit about um, HIV science and cure and sort of what the future might look like. This is something that, that was exciting for me. I'm not an HIV scientist, so I'm gonna refer um, all questions, and just generally, if you're interested in this, um, to this presentation by Dr. Anthony Fauci, on which I'm have, relying heavily, there's a link. Um, and he is the director of the NIH National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. In a sense, he's the chief immunologist in the United States. His presentation is brilliant, succinct, 
uh, interesting, informative, and delivered with a really, really strong Brooklyn accent. So you know, <laughs> you can't go wrong. It's worth it's worth a watch. Um, but he sort of starts with this question of what is a cure for HIV? Because we feel like we're getting to the point where we might know what it might look like in the immediate term. But you know, traditionally, when we cure a disease, it's either you know, permanent eradication of the microbe from the body. So okay, that's it. Germ is gone. You're cured. Or permanent remission of the disease following therapy. Well, with HIV, the problem we have, of course, is that we can get to an undetectable so-called viral load, but we do, we do know that the virus will rebound if people stop treatment. So that's obviously not a cure. We need to determine sort of how, what needs to be done and how long needs to have passed before someone can be deemed cured. Um, and all of this sort of speaks to this question of the HIV reservoir. So in Melbourne, there was a lot of discussion of the HIV reservoir. Um, what is that? Well, it's I'm going to put it in very lay terms. It's, it's where HIV hides out in the body um, after someone has an, an undetectable viral load. Um, and what's partially interesting about it is that it's quite complex. So it's not one place. It's multiple parts of the body uh, we're finding and also multiple cell types. So we all know, you know HIV infects um, T cells, but, but there are different types of cells. And some of them are long, long lasting. Um, and so uh, the science is starting to point to this idea that we need to figure out where HIV infects first and sort of gains a foothold such that it can hang out for a very long time um, after treatment. Similarly, and this also points to cure opportunities, what is the status of the virus in the body? So, um, you know, is it hiding out but defective? That could be a good outcome. If we could, if we, maybe we can't eliminate HIV, but maybe we can, as they call it, shock and kill um, the remaining reservoir of HIV. So it's still there, but it can't do anything, which would also be fine. Uh, well, all of this, um, the research that's, that's coming out is starting to point to maybe uh, the idea might be that the, the key to cure is early, early treatment. So you probably heard last year of the Mississippi baby. This was a newborn infant in Mississippi in the United States who commenced antiretroviral therapy at 30 hours uh, after birth. That is what we call early treatment. <laughs> um, and what's interesting, of course, for the HIV researchers, for the scientists, is that um, you know, newborns have very naive immune systems to begin with, and we know that HIV attacks the immune system, lives in the immune system. So trying to find out more about that can give us some clues. As you may know, unfortunately, I think this time last year, the newspapers were saying there had been a baby cured of HIV. Um, that proved not to be the case. So um, <clears throat> the child uh, went off therapy at 18 months of age and went for a long period with an undetectable viral load. At 30 months of age, I think they thought, oh, maybe this has happened. I think it was 46 months of age. There was a viral rebound. No one knows quite why or how um, the baby was able to control the infection and how the rebound occurred. But it starts to paint a picture and there's a lot to research. I think even more sort of directly um, interesting is the, the so-called Visconti trial. This is a um, research based on a very large database of HIV positive people in France. And within that, there's this cohort of 14 patients who um, were treated with antiretroviral therapy during primary HIV infection, so very, very early. Um, and then they subsequently discontinued the therapy and um, as of the publication of this, uh, this study, at, after four to nine and, nine and a half or almost 10 years of time, um, there was no viral rebound in these 14 people. So they seem to be um, controlling the virus post-treatment, the, therefore being called post-treatment controllers. Um, and um, one thing that's interesting that gives us this uh, clue is that very few of them appear to have HIV-infected central memory CD4 T cells. Now, um, that's one of those types of T cells and, and it's believed that it may be one of the places that HIV hangs out. And it's also believed that maybe early, early, early treatment prevents HIV from getting into those key little hidey holes, if you will, um, that make full um, cure so difficult. Um, so what, about, what does all this mean? Well, we don't know, so I'll skip to the still more questions than answers. But it gives us a clue that maybe um, early treatment and preventing HIV at the infection um, state in some ways could be the, the key to some sort of future cure or combination cure. Um, and there are policy implications for us. Um, obviously, if we're gonna catch HIV this early, there's gonna be a lot of early testing. How do we get that done? How do we pay for it? Um, and in order to get that done, we probably need to make sure that the health system and people in key affected populations are well aware if this is the track that we start to move down. Um, so I wanna say something about what this sort of combination cure could look like in terms of out of the conference, this is sort of the the puzzle pieces fitting together a little bit at what it might look like. This is a slide that I've stolen, so do credit there. Another great presentation that I recommend uh, from one of the plenaries at the conference. But um, a quick word about HIV vaccine. You probably all know that um, 
There have been a lot of swings and misses with HIV vaccine, but there are still many innovative new ideas coming down the pipeline. So, so it's not said that nothing's going to happen. Um, obviously, we'd like a vaccine that prevents infection. But um, another really interesting idea is that maybe the vaccine could modulate immunity to limit this viral reservoir. So we're talking about how really early treatment could prevent HIV from getting that foothold. Maybe a vaccine wouldn't prevent infection, but it could allow someone to be curable by sort of doing the same thing as early treatment, preventing HIV from getting into certain places at the point of infection, at the time of infection. So that might be part of the combination. Um, then obviously what I've just been speaking about, early diagnosis and early treatment to limit the HIV reservoir and limit HIV re replication very early. And then there are novel therapies being explored, including I think gene therapy was the one that was most spoken about at the conference. Um, and this sort of shock and kill, which it must be an American. As an American, I can say this. It must have been an American <laughs> who invented that terminology. But this idea that we'll take the HIV reservoir, you know, get viral loads, it's undetectable, and then shock and kill what's left. So um, hopefully that is what the future looks like. I want to just take a moment to give a flavor of the conference as well. As Bill Clinton said when he was being protested um, down in the bottom left, that's a photo of that uh, during his talk at the conference. This is more, it was more than a conference. Um, it's a movement and that's right. The HIV response has long been a movement and it was good to see that the, pro the world of protest was alive and well because we know that the protest movement in the history of HIV has driven the HIV response and without it, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. Um, also up in the upper left, you will see the woman working from the condomized zone. Anyone who was at the conference will tell you that this was unavoidable. Um, this was right in the center of the, of the foyer. This was a UNFPWA funded project called the condomized zone. And this woman was amazing. She spoke all day long in English and French, promoting uh, new technologies around the female condom in particular. And so what you see up there are, she's holding up two as yet unapproved possible iterations of the female condom. Um, despite the, let's call it, failure of the first iteration of the female condom, the need for preventative technologies, not just um, curative technologies, still exists, especially ones that are uh, female controlled. And these are two different possible ways to make um, the technology more palatable to women and their partners. Um, in the bottom right is the opening of a really um, impressive, um, or I guess bright spot in the conference. This is the Deputy Minister for Health from Myanmar. And this was really a moment where that country was stepping out onto the global stage um, and speaking honestly and transparently about the HIV epidemic in that country and the response to date and maybe some of the changes that need to happen. So um, that flavor, that international flavor was, was wonderful and very relevant to us in WA because Burma, Myanmar um, is a place where we have many people have come to WA from that country um, and we have links. So that's also very relevant. Um, and then in the upper right, last but definitely not least, that is WA's own Sharing Stories project from MMRC. Um, this is on the main stage of the Global Village during the closing ceremony, and, and they were killing it. They did a wonderful job representing the state. Um, uh, yeah, so um, we do have some links and references for your use in the presentation. And this is some of the people at the Western Australian um, booth. 